All right, we are back on True Footy with another edition of cycling through all the trade rumors that are swirling at the moment. I've been doing this once a month, so this is this month's edition of that. Um, it may get a little bit more regular as we approach the back end of the season. I think rumors are starting to hot up a little bit, especially after the buy rounds, because that is generally where um, players tend to meet other clubs. That's usually a good opportunity for that to happen. We've had at least one case of that being reported on currently. In this video, we're just going to summarize a lot of the things being talked about, a lot of the stories, trying to cycle through what's what's fake news, what's likely to be real. In some cases, there's new stories. In some cases, there are updates to things that we already kind of suspected were happening. So let's get into it. Although before I do, please make sure you're subscribed to this channel. I am aiming for 30,000 subscribers by grand final day. And um, it's touch and go whether I'm going to get there. But if there's anyone who wants to see more content like this and footy content in general and hasn't subscribed, I'd really appreciate it. So one of the biggest names that I don't think I have discussed in a trade update on this channel this year is that of Chad Warner, who is having an unbelievable season and, you know, an outside chance for the Brownlow medal amongst three or four Sydney Swans at the moment, um, having by far a career best season. So the rumor around Chad Warner is that he's not out of contract at the end of this season. He's out of contract at the end of next season wouldn't be a free agent so it would require a trade in any scenario but the rumor is that Fremantle in particular are coming hard at Chad Warner he is an East Fremantle boy 2019 draft him up if I'm not mistaken so has connections to at least Luke Jackson and I think Jeremy Sharp is from that cohort as well a couple of East Fremantle teammates but either way they are apparently going to offer him 1.5 to 1.6 million dollars a season, which would make him currently the highest paid player in the competition. So part of this story is also the fact that Chad Warner has reportedly uh, delayed contract extension talks with the Sydney Swans. Now this doesn't really mean a lot, it can be a bad sign, but considering he's not out of contract at the end of this year, he's out of contract at the end of next year, and he'd also be you know, looking to maximize his negotiating power. It's not necessarily a massive red flag that he is delaying contract talks with Sydney. Like he's in the form of his life. If he continues to play this way, he is going to be in a really good position to you know, maximize the contract he gets from Sydney at the end of 2025. But it doesn't mean there's nothing to it as well. And the other elephant in the room is Sydney have so many gun players around this similar sort of age bracket as well, who are firing right now, it's going to be a struggle for them to be able to afford all of them or at least pay market price for all of them. In fact, it's going to be impossible to pay all of them market price because they have so many elite players. You consider Blakey, Mills, Heaney, uh, Golden as well. I think it just signed a massive contract, didn't he? So you could foresee the potential of a salary cap squeeze and someone like a Fremantle who are probably right in that window of needing someone like a Chad Warner. They already have statistically the best uh, midfield in the comp, at least by clearance differential. It's worth noting, so Fremantle currently have three first round picks in this year's draft. Now, even if they were successful in getting Chad Warner to agree to come to Fremantle, the next part of the equation is getting Sydney to agree to give him up a year early. That seems super unlikely to me. So what they could be doing is, you know, canvassing his uh, interest in moving to Perth a year out, then maybe they'll pounce in 2025. The problem is their first round draft picks are in this year's draft. So it'll be very interesting to see what Fremantle do with their first round picks this year. They hold their own Collingwoods and Port Adelaide's in this year's draft. So do they, do they shuffle those into the future? If they do, that might be quite telling as to the future of Chad Warner, but something to be you know, cognizant of. That would be an absolutely enormous trade deal if it did happen. So we'll wait and see. Again, there's no real indication he's interested, but being a WA boy, being an East Fremantle boy with some friends and connections in that team and likely a pay bump from what he's going to get at Sydney, I'd keep an eye out for that. Let's talk about Tyson Stengel. This one has emerged more recently. I think he's out of contract at the end of the year. Well, that is absolutely the case. And because he's been a delisted free agent before, he is now an unrestricted free agent for life, which uh, gives him certain power that other players that have been at their clubs for the same amount of time do not have. He's only been at Geelong a few years, but apparently getting offered about $800,000 a season from rival clubs. The main one that's been reported, I think by John Ralph in the Herald Sun, is that St Kilda are having a huge crack at him. I think the implication is that Geelong are not quite offering the same amount. And you'd imagine, you know, with their contract situation, they might have some flexibility. I mean, they just took on the Jack Bowes contract. They do have a lot of veterans out of contract. It's hard to imagine this happening other than, you know, to pass on the knowledge that St Kilda are having a massive crack. And St Kilda are pretty proactive in the trade and free agency pace generally. I'd imagine, you know, Geelong don't really lose players in this way. But nonetheless, just passing on what is being discussed out there. Let's talk about Liam Baker. This, this one does feel like it is going to happen. In fact, of any of the trade deals that I'm going to discuss or have discussed at all this year, this one, you know, alongside maybe Bailey Smith, feels the most obvious the way it's going to play out. Call me silly, I don't know. 
But hey guys, just a quick note to let you know that this video is brought to you in a paid partnership with BetterHelp. You know, since I got back to the UK, I've been thinking a lot about mental health. Personally had a lot on my mind and it's got me thinking a lot about how this specific lifestyle that I choose, where I'm very dedicated to making content, etc., right now, the unfortunate byproduct of that is that it's made me feel very socially isolated. And that can be difficult when you have a lot on your mind. And, you know, some people might be able to relate to that. And for others, they might not feel socially isolated as such. They might be surrounded by loved ones, they might be surrounded by friends, but, you know, sometimes people just don't want to feel like a burden if they want to talk to people about the way they're feeling. I think there is a lot to be said for being able to verbalize the way. Way that you're feeling. Sometimes it's not even just about problem solving the issues that you have in your life. Sometimes it's just about getting that negative energy that you have inside of you out of you. This is where therapy in general, but better help specifically can come in and add a lot of value to your life. It's basically a platform that matches you with a credentialed therapist who is trained to listen and give helpful, unbiased advice. If you want to check out more info, check out the link in the description of this video and the pinned comment or go to betterhelp.com forward slash true footy. You'll fill out a questionnaire to assess your specific needs. Then they'll match you with a therapist with years of experience at helping people just like you. And usually you will get matched with a therapist within 48 hours. And then scheduling your sessions is really easy and you can do it by a phone call, you can do it by a video chat, whatever is the most convenient for you. It is literally the most convenient way to seek therapy. Let BetterHelp connect you with a therapist who can help you today. And if you use my link, like I said, betterhelp.com forward slash true footy, you will enjoy a special discount on your first month as well. Thanks guys, let's get back to the video. Let's talk about Liam Baker. So he has just met with West Coast at the mid-season buy, apparently. He's out of contract, not a free agent. I've said this in previous videos, but just to re-clarify, not a free agent. He's only been at Richmond seven years. So a trade will be necessary to get Liam Baker from Richmond. Now, you go back to April, John Ralph said back then that he was very likely to leave Richmond and West Coast would be the likely favorite. West Coast presumably wanting some middle tier in terms of age bracket sort of players to help this rebuild. That's really where the gap is on their list. As we know, Fremantle are probably more equipped to make a trade deal happen. I don't think West Coast would give up what is currently pick three to make this deal happen. Fremantle have two to three late first rounders and it's probably about a late first rounder is right for Liam Baker. So the specifics and the logistics around this deal a little bit harder to map out this far out, but it does seem like Liam Baker is going to leave Richmond at the end of the year. Obviously, you know, kind of jumping ship from one rebuilding club to another, but naturally being a West Australian boy, um, he's obviously got those sorts of motivations. There's a couple of Western Bulldogs players we'll discuss. Obviously, uh, Jamar is committed to the Western Bulldogs now, so we're left with Tim English and Bailey Smith. No meaningful update other than to say that with Tim English in particular, there seems to be some haggling over, uh, over the length of contract at the moment at Western Bulldogs. It's reported that he's been offered five years. He wants six or seven at you know a significantly higher dollar amount as well. He's looking for that six or seven years. In terms of suitors for Tim English, you know, for a reigning All-Australian ruck, it's actually kind of interesting. There's not too many teams like vying for his services. I suppose that's a reflection of the role. I mean, it isn't super common, I suppose, to see a club, you know, go all out in terms of trade and free agency for a ruck. You know, there's been some cases where, you know, rucks have gone cheaply and then turned out to be a gun. But it is a little bit atypical to spend big dollars acquiring a ruck from another club. You know, Grundy's a little bit of a, its own example. But it was reported in the Herald Sun as well that, you know, the only one that made sense was West Coast and they're reportedly not interested at the moment. And there's also no real update on Bailey Smith. Again, that one seems like it'll happen, uh, but I just thought I'd mention it. Those are the two contract situations that the Bulldogs are going to be left with currently. For me, there's a bit of intrigue around Harry Perriman and Isaac Cumming, a couple of GWS players that are both unrestricted free agents, certainly Harry Perryman, uh, which just means that their clubs can't match the bid and therefore force a trade. They can walk to wherever they choose. So there's four clubs currently interested in Harry Perryman, who I think is an underrated player. The both of the South Australian clubs, Hawthorne and Essendon, throughout the year have also been linked to him. He has been offered a five-year deal from the Giants, so that to me suggests that he's a required player. And you know, according to his manager Scott Lucas, there isn't a whole lot of impetus for Perryman to want to leave. He's fairly settled. He did mention though he wants to play as a midfielder, and that might be a little bit tight at the Giants. I'm not really too sure as an outsider how realistic that is. So that might only be the the little variable here that makes Perryman possibly gettable if a club can really sell him a future 
presumably on a high contract and in the position that he wants. We'll see what happens there. But Isaac Cumming is another one that I think is slipping under the radar. A bit of an underrated running defender. He's been linked to the Gold Coast Suns as someone they're interested in. It might be a contingency. You know, we talked about them going for Dan Rioli in the last video that I did. Isaac Cumming it would be a very, very good backup and potentially a little bit cheaper. Who knows? But um, two players there that are certainly worth keeping an eye on in this space. I feel like I've talked about Ben Ainsworth in every trade-up that I've done this year just because he simply is a quality player, in my opinion, that is out of contract and a restricted free agent at the end of this season. I just think he makes sense to be a high-profile target, and a lot of them are being ticked off now. You know, McCluggage has just signed a contract, etc. cetera. Uh, but apparently, the Suns have offered a four-year deal to Ben Ainsworth, and he still hasn't signed. There's been a, a vague link to Essendon. I feel like having just recruited Gresham, I feel like that, you know, Perkins is in there. They're going to need to give games to Caddy. It is difficult to see, you know, a, a real need for Essendon to acquire Ben Ainsworth. Port Adelaide is also another club interested. So it looks like Port Adelaide are ha heavily canvassing the free agency space because they've traded out of like three consecutive first rounds of drafts. Their hands are tied with recruitment other than free agency. It looks like they're going after Perryman. It looks like they throw their hat in the ring for a Ben Ainsworth as well. It does sound like it's more likely to result in Ainsworth staying at the Gold Coast Suns. He's been well paid the entire time he was there. But obviously we're fairly late in the season now and he hasn't re-signed. So there's still going to be a little bit of conjecture around the future of him. Let's talk about Logan McDonald. This one's an interesting one. So Ryan Daniels reported very recently that Sydney were very close to signing up Logan McDonald on a contract extension for a couple of years. Again, not a free agent, so no reason to sign him up on a massive contract. However, he then amended the tweet or, or at least added context to the tweet and said there was a bit of a development and that two clubs have come hard for Logan McDonald and offering a big bump in salary compared to what Sydney is offering him. And like we said at the start of the video, Sydney are going to have a bit of a mission trying to fit all of these guns on their list who are in that age where they're starting to get pay rises, you know? So the two clubs were Hawthorne and the Collingwood Footy Club. Now, again, like I say with every Collingwood trade rumor, they don't have a first round draft pick this year and their ability to land some of these players who are going to require trades, uh, I'm a little bit baffled by it, but nonetheless, they're having a crack. Um, good for them. He is a pie or was a pie supporter. They obviously need some key position talent. So that one makes sense. And then Hawthorne, um, you know, they're also linked to Bailey Smith, so they're probably going to have to make a choice here. Could they offer up their two first round picks and get Smith and Logan McDonald? I suppose that's possible. For the record, it does sound like Logan is very happy at Sydney, and why wouldn't you be? You know, top of the ladder and getting games, you know, playing pretty well from what I've seen for his age as well. I, I see no real reason to leave Sydney. It's just a case of that salary piece, like $200,000 a year is a lot for a young guy. And I mean $200,000 above what he was being offered. Couple of rumors on St. Kilda players as well. So Josh Battle is an interesting one as well. Qualifies as an unrestricted free agent. I'm not 100% sure why he's unrestricted. I'm going to assume it's because he's not paid heavily enough. Like if you're not in the top 10 or haven't made the top 10 of the BNF, there's all these like weird rules that I haven't memorized. But nonetheless, he's unrestricted, which means again, St. Kilda don't have the power to match a bid and force a trade. And that does make them a little vulnerable here because he is a quality player. And in my opinion, a very important player for St. Kilda as well. Not necessarily a grade star, but very good player, I reckon. So he's attracted interest, as you'd imagine. Hawthorne and I think Collingwood as well have been linked to him. And I think, um, you know, both of those sides probably need some reinforcement in terms of tall defenders. And, you know, looking from the outside at St. Kilda right now, you can imagine they're probably players looking left and right. Doesn't mean that they're right to leave, but you can understand why, you know, the grass looks a little bit greener at clubs like Collingwood and Hawthorne. So this is an important time. Uh, for St Kilda to really consolidate their list management. And, and that also leads to this story. I don't know how real this is. Tom Morris has reported that Rowan Marshall might be a player considering moving sideways to another club as well. Now, he's very non-committal with his language. I think he says it on SEN Breakfast. He'd keep an eye on Rowan Marshall. They're not the most settled environment at the moment, the Saints. Clubs have become aware more recently that Marshall is one of those players that might have a look around if the right deal presents. So again, very non-committal, and in Rowan Marshall is, is well and truly contracted. Uh, that's at least my understanding. So it would require something monumental for that to happen. And like I said, I'm shooting off the hip here, but I don't really remember too many times clubs paid big in terms of trade or free agency to take someone else's star ruckman. There seems to be cheaper ways of acquiring a ruck and building a team around differently. So we'll see. 
But yeah, St Kilda have a bit of a challenge selling a future to some of their players. I think Josh Battle is the more immediate worry. Cam Zohar also falls under the bracket of a team needing to sell a future to him. Now, Zohar is out of contract, uh, should be a restricted free agent come the end of the season, and has previously spoken publicly that he wants to play for a team playing in finals and being competitive. Now, halfway through the season, we've seen three good weeks from North, and prior to that, well, they were entirely winless. Now, the problem with North here is that they're going to have to sell him a future in the next, how many games are there left? Eight, nine? This will be a challenge. This will be a challenge. What can North do in the final eight to nine weeks to say, Cam Zoha, okay, we're not playing finals this year, but we're probably gonna be there in two years. Zoha's 26. I feel like the motivation for Zoha leaving is relatively there. And I actually don't want that to happen. I don't think it would be good for the game if North Melbourne lose another established player to free agency. Now, it might result in ban one compensation depending on who goes after him. We've seen him linked to Essendon before. I'd imagine both WA clubs are interested in him as a free agent. You'd imagine Port Adelaide throw their hat in the ring given um, you know where they're at currently as well. But if he's serious about wanting to play finals at 26 years old, I can see him not willing to be patient to stay at North Melbourne. And I hope it, I hope that's not right. I hope he stays. But this is probably one of legitimate concern. We, we hear talks about LDU as well. LDU, for a start, hasn't made those same comments as Zoha has, and they have an extra year. So, you know, we could reassess in a year if, if the uh, Roos are looking like Hawthorne now. We'll see, but but they don't have the same time to convince Cam Zuha. Just thought I'd touch base on a couple of West Coast Eagles rumors around Tom Barras and Elliot Yo. Elliot Yo has either signed or it's about to happen on a three-year extension with the West Coast Eagles, which is a pretty lengthy extension for a guy who's turning 30 in October this year. But nonetheless, the rumors linking him to Adelaide and Geelong and God knows who else um, have now been quashed. So that's out the window. However, Tom Barras, we have seen more recently him linked to the Western Bulldogs and Collingwood. Two teams trying to you know, shore up their key defensive stocks and both teams seeing themselves either in the window or right prior to the window. Again, I feel like this one is so unlikely purely because Brass is you know, on a massive contract for at least another three years, I reckon. His partner and he are settled in Western Australia. Now, I'm not saying that Tom Barras wouldn't be able to be talked into moving east, but given his contract status, West Coast do hold the bargaining power here, which means they can easily just say no. And given that neither Western Bulldogs or Collingwood hold a first round draft pick, this just seems so unlikely to me. Far less likely than the rumor linking him to Sydney, I think 12 months ago. Uh, while we're on the topic of Collingwood, we'll go through a couple of players here. There was a bit of fake news about Bobby Hill apparently wanting to go to WA. Um, that was immediately quashed. I just thought I'd touch base on that. It looks like he might be looking to extend his contract at Collingwood fairly imminently. There's also a little bit of a side note here that Joe Richards has attracted a bit of interest. Now, if you don't know who Joe Richards is, um, I don't really blame you because he's fairly new to the scene. He's a mature age 24-year-old player that's made a really good start to his AFL career. I think he's injured currently, but he's made such an impact that clubs are already looking sideways at, at the pies. And it may be the case that the clubs who are looking for a small forward, so your Ainsworths, your Stangles, they might be looking at a relatively cheaper option in Joe Richards. But again, it's impossible to really get a feel for how likely any of that is. And finally as well, there was a little bit of fake news as well on Daniel Curtin. It seems like someone misinterpreted a SEN segment with Tim Gossage where I think they were hypothesizing about Daniel Curtin going back to WA. It just turned out to be mis misinterpreted. Uh, as far as I can tell, Daniel Curtin is not going to request a trade out of Adelaide this year. But anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you got something out of it. Let me know in the comments anything I've missed or anything you found interesting in that. As always, I appreciate you watching. I appreciate you being subscribed and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.